What's up and welcome to the video. I'm Dr. Daniel Ricciardi, gut health expert, licensed pharmacist, fitness enthusiast, and creator of SIBO Shortcut, the comprehensive system that helps you eliminate SIBO and keep it from coming back. Welcome to 2024. We're going to kick off this year by discussing a condition called intestinal methanogen overgrowth, aka IMO. I've made quite a few videos on SIBO before, and we've definitely talked about methane gas, but I haven't made a video entirely on this one particular type of overgrowth. So in this video, we're going to discuss the old and new names for IMO, how IMO differs from SIBO, how methane gas gets produced, symptoms of IMO, diagnosis of IMO, and then treatment. Let's get started. Intestinal methanogen overgrowth. It's a relatively new term begun to be used in the past several years. It used to be called methane dominant SIBO. And to be fair, this label as well as methane SIBO are still pretty frequently used. I've also used the term SIBO as an umbrella term that includes multiple types of overgrowths, including IMO. I do this just because it's simpler and less confusing. How is IMO different than SIBO? There's two key differences in why intestinal methanogen overgrowth is different from SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The first way is that both the small or large intestine can actually be involved. Thus, the switch from small intestinal to just intestinal is made. The second way is that methanogens are the microorganisms that produce methane. These methanogens are technically part of a large classification of microorganisms called archaea. And these archaea, although they're one cell organisms, technically they're different than bacteria. And this is why the B in SIBO is changed to an M in intestinal methanogen overgrowth. There's a variety of different methanogen microbes that produce methane gas in people with IMO. However, the most prevalent one is one called methanobrevibacter smithy. Next up, how does this methane gas come to be? Why is it there and how does it get there? Methane gas is not in inherently bad. A large percentage of healthy people actually produce a small amount of methane every day. The issue is when there's too much methane gas produced. But before methane gas can be produced, hydrogen gas actually has to be produced first. After you consume carbohydrates, fiber, and sugar, a process called fermentation needs to take place first. This term fermentation refers to when bacteria in your gut digest and metabolize these carbohydrates, sugars, and fiber and produce hydrogen gas as a byproduct. Ideally, the vast majority of this fermentation will happen in your large intestine and not your small intestine. If a lot of this does happen in your small intestine, this is often characteristic of SIBO. After that hydrogen gas is produced by fermentation, this hydrogen gas can then be used to make methane gas. Four molecules of hydrogen are actually used to produce one molecule of methane. And keep in mind that you will not have methane gas without hydrogen gas. This is why even if your breath test is only showing high levels of methane gas, it's still a good idea idea to treat the hydrogen producing bacteria as well when you're doing your treatment. And speaking of treatments, if you're ready to get rid of that bloating, that constipation, and digestive symptoms of intestinal methanogen overgrowth once and for all, so you can get back to eating that healthy diet you used to eat out the fear of discomfort, you need to check out SIBO Shortcut. SIBO Shortcut is an online program backed by science to help you get rid of SIBO and IMO and prevent it from coming back. If you want to learn how to get rid of SIBO, visit the first link down in the description below for more info. And now let's get back to the video. As for the symptoms of intestinal methanogen overgrowth, there's a couple that stand out above the rest in terms of how frequently they happen. They are number one, bloating and abdominal distension. These are incredibly popular in both SIBO and IMO. Abdominal distension is really similar to bloating. I'm adding it in here because sometimes bloating can exist without abdominal distension or somebody may just feel bloated, but they may not necessarily look bloated. Abdominal distension is when your stomach actually sticks out further and if you were to measure it with a measuring tape, you notice that it's actually larger. When I had IMO, I had bloating and abdominal distension all the time, and my stomach was regularly a couple inches larger or more almost every day of the week, especially at night after dinner. And then the second major symptom people experience with IMO is constipation. Not everybody with IMO will experience constipation. It's actually possible to have loose stools and still have IMO, but the vast majority of people will have some degree of constipation. Constipation can mean that you don't pass a regular bowel movement daily. It can also mean that you do pass regular bowel movements daily or even multiple times a day, but the bowel movements are these small, hard, tiny pellet-shaped stools. If you're confused as to what I'm talking about, looking at the Bristol stool chart can really help clarify this. Basically, if your stool's in the range of, say, like a three to five, it's probably pretty good. Whereas if you're all the way on the one to two range of the chart, it's possible that you're dealing with constipation. Ways to deal with constipation. Bloating and constipation 
can be a vicious cycle. The more constipated that you are, the more bloating and abdominal distension you may experience. This is because stuff is just not traveling through your digestive tract and it's just sitting there. And the more stool that you have sitting there not moving, it's more likely that you'll also have more gas causing bloating. This is why addressing constipation is so crucial to reducing symptoms of IMO. This is also something that you should really try to address before starting a treatment for IMO. This is because toxins are produced when these microbes start to be eliminated. And bowel movements are a great way for your body to rid itself of these toxins. Therefore, it may help reduce what is known as a Herx reaction, which is extra symptoms, new symptoms, or worsening of symptoms that you may experience during your treatment. Some options that may help with constipation include magnesium citrate, partially hydrolyzed guar gum or PHGG, vitamin C, digestive enzymes, drinking more water, going for a short walk after eating, and black coffee or tea. Diagnosing intestinal methanogen overgrowth. This is easiest done by using a breath test that checks for both hydrogen and methane. To do a breath test, you'd first drink a sugar solution, then exhale into a device or tubes several times over the course of two to three hours. As far as treatment for IMO, there is research supporting the use of herbals, antibiotics, and the elemental diet. To the best of my knowledge, there are not any studies that currently investigate the role of the carnivore diet specifically for intestinal methanogen overgrowth. However, in a 2021 study looking at a completely zero carb carnivore diet for hydrogen dominant SIBO, some patients experience a reduction in methane levels after using a completely zero carb carnivore diet for two to six weeks. Unfortunately, at this time, there's not much published research about the use of the carnivore diet for either SIBO or IMO. If you have tried it, please let me know in the comments below. In terms of causes of intestinal methanogen overgrowth, for many people, having slow gut motility is the biggest causative factor in developing SIBO or IMO. And there's a ton of potential root causes that can lead to this slow gut motility that can cause SIBO or IMO. Some include food poisoning, which is a major one, chronic stress, antibiotics, diabetes, and having hypothyroid. This is by no means a complete list, but just wanted to rattle off a few to give you an idea of what can contribute to slow gut motility. Speaking from personal experience now, I dealt with intestinal methanogen overgrowth for about eight years. I didn't really deal with constipation, but bloating and abdominal distension were two things I had really badly, very constantly. I was also always passing gas, which usually started after eating breakfast. I used to eat oatmeal every day, and for me personally, that one food happened to be the worst by far of any foods I was eating. Not that oatmeal is inherently bad, it's just for me, the symptoms were awful. Eating in general was just not a fun experience because I only really felt good when I was fasting. After the overgrowth was gone, fortunately, this wasn't the case anymore, and I was able to eat most of what I wanted, including oatmeal, without ruining everyone's day. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more related content. I post a new full-length video every Monday in YouTube Shorts throughout the week. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.